Hey, welcome back everyone. Uh, what we've got is another Panzer Blitz set up here. This is on uh, the east front, which is currently in beta testing. You can go to ConSim World, do a search for the uh, Panzer Blitz east front. You'll find all the files you need to play. Uh, you got to use Vassal though, so if you're not a big Vassal fan, you know, you, you, you do what you can, take it with a grain of salt. But uh, it, it'll give you a chance to, to look at the new rules, the version 3 rules. And you know, possibly maybe use the version three rules in your Panzer Blitz two game. Check it out, see what's different. Um, but I, I recommend looking into it, or just watch this and kind of see how this plays out. If you've never played Panzer Blitz before, for me, this is my first experience with it. Um, I have not played the the series previously, so this is my first time really kind of looking into it. And what I did here to kind of learn the game is I decided to set up my own scenario not do a situation one from the rules because it includes some things like artillery and engineers that my read I just wasn't really ready to play with that all those rules so to help me learn kind of get a, a feel for the the turn sequence and structure and just some basic movement and combat what I did this is a little bit different than the setup I had before but I just basically just threw out some vehicles at random uh, I got some Germans here and then some Soviet forces over here on the right. And then you just uh, kind of practice maneuvering a little bit and shooting at one another. The other thing, too, is you got to have your cup. Now, this, this is the important thing. All of these troops are going to kind of be able to act based on how many initiative chits that you put in. So if you're a budding scenario designer, one of the things to really, really consider in your scenario is exactly how much initiative are you going to give to each side. So what I did, uh, I'm, I'm going to do the same thing. What I'm going to do is open up uh, my initiative chits, and I'm going to put down just some OP zeros. Put a couple OP zeros. Um, you know, I tell you about. Let's let's do this. Let's let's delete that one. Delete. We're going to put an OP zero and an OP-1 for the Germans. And then for the Soviets, I'm going to put an OP-0 and one OP-1. Now, this is not balanced in any way whatsoever with forces and initiative. Again, this was just a way for me to sit down, kind of look over the rules, practice moving and shooting, because that really is the basics right there of, of any game, is moving your troops in so they can fight and kill each other. Um, I haven't included infantry, so we'll look at infantry later at another time. This is strictly just vehicles. It's how I learned Panzer. Panzer really focuses, it's a you know vehicle-focused game. I like the tanks, so that's what I'm going to do here, move around my little platoons of tanks. Now, the initiative is important because um, as you draw these, in, well, we'll see. We'll, we'll cover the initiative as we get to it. Let's not jump ahead too much. So I've got my cup. I'm going to maybe put that up here. So... The way the game works here, and we can look at the rules together. You can come and read the rules yourself, but you know, just to make sure, help keep me honest, um, I can kind of. This is some of the rules setting up, stacking limits. Right now, I have nothing stacked. All of these initial units placed are each in their own hex. I could stack them up, but I just have them set out in their own hex for right now. But that really does affect your choices for combat, whether you're on the defense or offense. It, it really does make a difference if they're stacked or not. Currently, I have nothing stacked. Uh, then it talks about transporting, violations of the stacking limits. I, I would like to rewrite and make my own house rule for stacking limits, but that's for another video. Operation chits. Okay, so here's the game turn. This is where... This is the engine. The game is actually very simple on the outside. Because you're in your turn, there's pretty much just a couple things that you can do. Um, when you want to do something, there's really about four things you can do. Well, five that they have here. But... Well, four, four things. So there's, when you start your turn and you're going to activate one of your units, you got to decide, is that unit going to be used to activate artillery? That's one option. Are you going to set yourself up 
to do overrun combat. Certain units can overrun infantry. You can even overrun armor. So I read that up. Do you want to set up for assault fire? So again, there's certain restrictions to assault fire. Um, oh, I'm getting into to movement. Never mind. Sorry, I got ahead of myself. There's request artillery. You can then set your units up to either fire, direct fire, or the indirect. Like once you designate somebody to shoot, then you can actually go through the direct fire steps or the indirect. So that's that's two things. The third thing is move. Now, when you talk about movement, that's when we can talk about assault move and, and things like that. There's different types of movement. And then finally, you have the option to uh, recover from disruption. Or like, instead of disruption, I think of it, it's like suppression is a term I'm used to. So that's really four things that your unit can do. Call in artillery, shoot, move, or try to recover from disruption. That's it. It gets complicated when you do those things, which you know, depending on which one you pick, then you have to go and read the subset of rules to make sure you're doing it correctly. You know, okay, so that that's your four things right there: artillery, fire, move, recover from disruption. So to do that, essentially, it's the the chip pull system that that I, I've talked about before in other videos. Now the pre-operations, that's like the first part here. Uh, there's different things you gotta do. You put in your chits. Now the scenario, like when you actually do play a scenario, it's gonna designate and tell you exactly what chits you put into the cup at the start of the game. And then also the scenario, or your situation card will dictate as you progress at what turn do you add in, say, a reinforcement chit. Or maybe at turn four, you get to add in another operations chit. I would not be surprised at some point if they have scenarios that tell you certain turn in, you remove operation chits. So pay attention to your situation card so you know exactly how to populate your cup with your uh, command chits. All right, after you've got your chits in, and this goes in and talks about the last chit drawn, drawing your chits, uh, each player, each player part of that operations phase, this is also going to be where you could uh, make adjustments to minefields, blocking, engineer type of things like that. But let's get down to the operations segment. Since all I have are tanks, I don't have to worry about anything else. Pretty much I've got the chits in my cup and now the operations segment comes up. And this is where you're going to draw a chit from the cup and decide who gets to go. So I'm going to move the rules off to the side. So in my cup, which I hope you can see, uh, up here I'm going to look at my pile now the way this vassal module works, and it's pretty clever, is when you put your chits over here in this draw pile and you pull one off, it randomly selects from the stack. So it automatically shuffles, you know, shakes the cup if you will. So you don't have to worry about if you put the two Germans on the in first and the two Soviets on the top, is it going to pull them out in the order that you put them in? It might feel that way depending on how you're playing, but it does randomize every time you pull. So I'm going to pull one marker, and I drew this OP0. So Germans get to go first. Now the op OP0 means it has a radius of zero. So that means I can only put this and activate units in one hex. And so this is why when you, when you set up your scenario card, you want to look and kind of get a feel for how many op zeros you get and maybe how many op ones because that's going to help you decide, am I going to stack my units initially? Now, I only put in two, two op chits per side here for the, for the practice. And I've got one op zero and one op one. So for my OP zero, I got to decide which one of these guys do I want to activate. And, and this is the pain. You know, going first is, is okay because maybe you want to shoot first. But I really don't have very good range. I have my, my Tiger 2 down here. Uh, it might have range. It has a range of 13. This 13 here in the corner. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. 9. It's within range. I, I could shoot if I wanted. So let's do that. I'm going to put... Now, what I do, because the Vassal, when you put a marker in here, it just makes a big old stack. You know, just... <coughs> excuse me, just kind of sticks them together. Uh, what you could do... And as long as you and your opponent agree, 
because remember there's some people who really play by the rule the the written rule of the game versus like maybe the spirit of the rule and and so you just have to let them know look just for purposes of how many things i'm stacking in this hex so i don't get a leaning tower of cardboard i'm just putting my op0 right next to the tank to activate it because i want to be able to see all my markers and my my unit numbers so this is this is how i learn i go ahead and i activate this unit here so what you do and this is nice when you just go through the rules that's i i really recommend you read the rules once that way you kind of know where things are so i know that when i shoot there are certain things you need to check line of sight now i'm not going to go through and read all the line of sight rules but essentially i purposefully put myself up here in the middle of the board so i wouldn't have a line of sight issue now this corn there is a special rule for corn in here or the uh, the growing wheat fields but i'm ignoring that i'm just going to say this is all open so this is about as easy as it can get for units to move and shoot at one another it's like a, a static range just about so we're going to say this is all open but for line of sight we have a line of sight tool what i could do is click on my unit well i'm gonna i think i messed up let me hit click and then drag click and drag a line over and release it on my target and what this is doing is basically if you're playing this for real uh, some people have laser sights string dental floss whatever lay it between the center point of the hex and the center point of your opposing hex and then you know check to see what terrain intervenes we have nothing I set up that way on purpose you know but in a normal game you might be on either side of a city well you can't shoot that blocks line of sight either side of the forest you can't shoot through that blocks line of sight so that's one thing you have to check is for line of sight the other thing you gotta check for is spotting so when you go to shoot to somebody you need to see if they are spotted so here's a lot of rules about line of sight inherent terrain but now you go to spotting now there are conditions for spotting such as you know if units are in like woods or cities or things like that you have to be within a certain distance of them to see them now there are some additional rules that that cover spotting so I won't go in too much detail other than to say according to how I have this set up we can spot because the rule says if you're within 20 hexes of a unit that's out in the open you can spot it you see it but if it's say like in the city you have to be within a certain distance now one thing that negates all of that is if that unit was marked with a spent marker let's see if I can find me one of these spent markers that they're talking about I clicked the wrong thing marker spent alright oops let me tell you how that would affect line of sight just briefly if I had this unit here in the city for instance uh, for spotting the rule says here because you look at your your uh, exceptions here uh, non-disrupted combat unit has a valid line of sight to the enemy unit and one or more of the following conditions are met the enemy unit is in a city town or wood swamp within three hexes alright so right now this unit shooting down here this unit would be unspotted but I have line of sight what that means is I get a penalty to my dice roll and that will affect my combat results when I shoot at it but if this unit had moved because after you perform an action you get to put a spent marker on that unit and this is this is a simplified version of, of uh, the rule set Panzer but this is why it makes sense to me in Panzer when you move you put a move marker on your tank so when it comes to spotting because they move that affects how far out you can spot a target when they fire you put a fired marker on that unit they have a spot fire spot uh, spot movement and those affect your ability to see a target so this is kind of the same thing except it just kind of combines all those actions into one so because this unit moved essentially my units 
tracked his movement into the city and they know that they're there. So that's why we can shoot on them or have potentially, you know, the, the uh, spotting because they have a spent marker. Now, if this unit had started in the city hex, we would not be able to spot it and we would get a plus four die roll modifier penalty. All right. So that that's why spotting is important. Just because you know that they're there doesn't mean that your shooting units necessarily have a close, you know, accurate sighting on your units. But again, since we're way out in the open, we can see each other just fine. So I'm going to activate this unit to shoot. So he has line of sight. He has spotting. So now we can take a look at how we shoot. So again, 7.0 talks about combat. It covers things from like having multiple units shoot at a target to how do you pick out a single target within a stack. Like if you have a bunch of infantry, do you attack all the infantry, just one infantry? If you have a bunch of armor, do you attack one armor? Well, infantry we'll cover later. But since we're doing vehicles, uh, if your vehicles were stacked, so let's say I had two in here, my firing units would designate one target in the stack. So you cannot attack, you don't attack the whole hex. You attack one armored target. But since I have these split up, uh, this is almost like single engagements. So this tank here is going to shoot at this tank here. I activated it with my ops chit. So now I'm going to conduct the steps. It's actually pretty simple, really. And I hope, yeah, I'll be able to show you that. So what I'll do is I look up here. Uh, let me see if I can zoom in. This might be... It's so hard to see the numbers here. Um, this tank, this is my Tiger II, it's got a 26 in white. This is my armored attack value. And I compare that down here with the defense value of this T-34. And I believe that's my T-34-85. It's 11. So what you do is you take your 26, subtract the 11, and that would be 15. I hope my math is right. Then what you do is you take a look at your let me pull this up oh it won't let me pull it up let me I wonder if I can open this with another program the silly Windows 8 it has its default reader program I'm gonna see if maybe I can if I have something else I can open this with I just open it in Chrome okay so you have here a combat chart yeah we'll just kinda cheat here I'll open it in Google Chrome. That'll make it work. So now what I do is I look at this fire table. I look at the AT fire. I go across the top, and I look for that difference. So I had a difference of 15 between my attack and my defender. Now, that puts me in this column for when I roll my dice. Down here, here are some modifiers for direct and reaction fire, dice roll modifiers. You can look at if your defender is in any, any kind of protection, um, potentially what like smoke fortification markers are in that particular hex you can look for the defender status are they unspotted are they disrupted are they traveling on a road then the attacker has modifiers too um, height advantage opportunity fire so essentially I have no dice roll modifiers according to the direct fire chart now we gotta look at range Okay, now I did forget to count this. Oh, I did. I just don't remember. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. We are a distance of. Oh shoot! I shouldn't have done that. I minimize that. So let's count here. I'm one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Nine hexes away. I look on my chart. Um, nine means I get a plus two dice roll modifier on the thirteen to fifteen column when I'm deciding how much damage I do. And damage is going to be determined by the dice roll, two dice six. So what I'm going to do is pull up my map, my map here, my vassal module, I've got built-in dice roller. So I roll two dice six here at the top. And I get a result of a four and a five. That's a nine. So I got to flip back to my chart. I'm going to go 9 straight across to that 15 and I get disruptions DD okay so now here comes the learning part 
and I'm hoping someone can explain to me, this is where I need your help. Applying damage, <laughs> I don't quite understand. So we're going to read here the combat results in CRT. Uh, luckily, it's a small section. So we'll go over this, and I think that's where I will stop this particular segment. I'll save the match where we're at. But um, th this is what I need help with, is understanding how to read the results, because this isn't like other games I've played before. Okay, so it says the combat results table is used to resolve all types of combat except for anti-aircraft combat. And the possible results are a dash, which means nothing happened. D, the defender is disrupted. You place a spent disrupted marker on top of the defending unit. Or a double D, which is what we had. Any defenders that were already disrupted before the attack suffer a step loss. All defenders suffer disruption and are marked with a spent disrupted marker. So if I just stop right there, if I stop right there, um, in my situation, I think I'm okay because it says if they were already disrupted, they suffer a step loss. He was not already disrupted, but all defenders suffer disruption and are marked with a spent disrupted marker. So the double D effect is would only really count for something if he was already disrupted. Now, if the unit was already disrupted and got a D, I guess you would just put a spent on him if he wasn't spent. I'm not sure. So let's go back to our module. So I'm going to have to put, now I don't have a marker that actually says spent disrupted. So let's see. See, I've got disrupted and disrupted plus three. I haven't read what that is, but I don't have a an actual one that says spent slash and disrupted. So what I was doing was putting a disrupted and then putting a spent right on top of it. So I'm hoping that's what you're supposed to do. So now if I go back to the rules, and, and this is where it gets tough, if you have the X's. So it says the defender must remove, like if you got the X, let's look at the chart. So for example, if I had, let's say I had the, got a result of a 3X. Let's just say 3X. It says, oops, come here rules. So the defender must remove that many number of steps from the target units. Each step loss is fulfilled by either flipping a full strength unit or removing a reduced unit. All targeted units must take an equal amount of step losses if possible. All other remaining targeted units suffer a DD, i.e. already disrupted. The units take a step loss. Finally, all remaining targeted units are marked with spent disrupted. So in my understanding, that would be if you had a stack and if I had to take three step losses, then every unit equally would need to suffer a step loss. So if I had three in there and I got a three X, then each unit would get a step loss. If one of those units already was on a reduced side, it would have to be flipped and taken out. If I had a three X and I only had one counter in that hex, then from full strength, reduce it once and then take it off. That'd be two step loss. And then that third X would go nowhere because there's no other unit in the hex. Now, if I had, let's take a look here. So now I'm wondering if I had two units, let's say I had, let's say I had those, those units here, and this is how I hope I'm interpreting it correctly. If I had the three X, I would have to flip this one. That's one X. And then that would be two X. And then here comes the third step loss. That's how I'm interpreting a three X. The damage gets assigned equally. And then if there's anything left over, then you know you would assign it. So let's let's talk about that. Let's let's flip these back. Flip. Flip. So let's say I had two x. Two x. Um, I would do a step loss here and a step loss here, and then let's read the rules. It says. The defendant must remove number of unit steps from the target. Each step loss is fulfilled by either flipping a full strength unit or removing a reduced unit. All targeted units must take an equal amount of step losses. Well, 
see now that doesn't work for armor because armor you only attack a single target you know unless it was like artillery so maybe artillery would affect but if I had infantry so let's pretend these are infantry because it won't work for armor because you only target one one thing let's see all targeted units must take an equal amount of step losses if possible all other remaining targeted units suffer a DD. Already disrupted units take a step loss. Finally, all remaining targeted units are marked spent disrupted. So, does that mean after I apply my step loss, anything that's remaining, because they were potentially part of the targeting, they go ahead and get a disruption marker? Like I'd had to put the spent disruption on him. So those took, took a step, step loss, and then if he was part of the targeting, but they ran out of X's. That's just the part that I'm not quite fully grasping. So again, if these were infantry, let's go ahead and and apply the the potential multiple step losses because I'm not quite grasping that part of the rules. So if somebody can break down for me exactly how do I apply the X's, that would be great because this was a terrible example to use because you can only target one vehicle inside that hex oh well let's let's talk about that let's say I had three and I apply a 6x so yeah I targeted one vehicle in the hex and if I apply you know 3x do you know I step loss that one unit and then anything remaining gets applied to the vehicles that were in the hex even though they weren't targeted so if I could just have somebody clarify that part for me. I'm sure the rules are written just fine. It's my brain that's not quite grasping the concept because it's a slightly different than other games I've played in the past. So I'm going to leave it here. Help me understand the uh, applying the combat results. When we come back, after I've gotten some responses, I'll see if I can clarify a little bit better my understanding of it. And then we can go on and, and draw some more turn markers and and maybe move some units and get close to each other. So thank you for watching. Share some comments. Maybe, you know, something else you want to cover uh, later down the road. I, I eventually plan on covering infantry, artillery, and things like that. Overrun, close assaults, you know. So a little bit at a time. A little bit at a time. Today, shooting. How do I apply damage? All right. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day. Thanks for watching.